revolutionary um, treatment uh, that hadn't been tried. He would be uh, effectively a guinea pig for other people. This, the consultant was very happy to do this, but the man needed to have leave first. We started doing the work to um, try and get him that leave to remain. The Home Office were aware of the situation, the Legal Aid Board were aware of the situation. Unfortunately, our client died before we were able to um, get a decision from the Home Office. In other parts of, of, of our normal lives that we, we, we take for granted, then schools and universities have also been put in the front line, making life difficult. Schools were expected to fill in questionnaires about nationality. I don't know if anyone here is a teacher, but I think you've probably got quite a lot of work to do. I, I'd like you to go on with the marking. But <laughs> if you want to take in questionnaires about nationality, that's good. It is a bit of a problem because most people are not very clear on nationality law. I'm not very clear on nationality law. I've been doing it for 25 years. So it's quite difficult to be able to just say what nationality is your child. A lot of people think their child is the same nationality as them, or they think they're British because they're born here. And normally it's somewhere between the two. So that's a, a, another thing. And, and there's no reason to do that, because it's not like the kids are going to be kicked out of the schools. It's not like they're going to be um, anything other than feel stigmatised, even if the schools themselves are not doing the stigmatising. It cannot have any other effect than doing that. And I'm really pleased to say that after challenges brought, around, brought about by grassroots organisers, then the um, obligation on that has disappeared. That's been challenged successfully. There's no need to do it. Oddly, some schools seem to be still issuing those, those questionnaires, though. In higher education, then, it's become clear that, that people, migrant children, migrant young people are being discouraged from thinking that they can be settled here in the long term. Even if in real life we know that they're going to be settled here, we know they're going to be here forever. So access to student finances, which is a pay for non-migrant children, for British children, for children who are settled here, is bad enough for them, then a lot of migrant children don't even have access to that. And it's taken a series of legal challenges to establish the right for children, who, young people who are clearly going to be going to university, who are clearly going to end up settled, but will not necessarily be settled on their 18th birthday or when they have to apply for or when they first start at university. It's taken a series of legal challenges to ensure that increasing numbers of those young people do have access to student finance. One of the, the other issues that came in in 2016 was uh, not a, extending the, the <coughs> role of employers as, as immigration officers to landlords as, as immigration officers. And I suspect many of you in this room, landlords are not your favourite people. But surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, many landlords, including their professional organisations, are supporting the challenges that are going on to stop the restrictions on, to stop the penalties for their members on um, renting and accommodation. Um, and to, in, in, to try and take that role, that criminalisation and that stigmatisation uh, away from that tendency for people who are si simply seeking to rent somewhere. Personally, we don't have lots of experience of people being refused, directly refused tendencies for, um, uh, for being unable to show documentation. However, we are aware of um, the knock-on effects of more overcrowding, of more people feeling insecure, of more people being worried about whether they can have migrant people in their household, whether they can share um, with people who haven't got documents. But actual direct experience, I can't say that we do have. The, the other things that we've, we've, we've seen people having little bits of their lives taken away that, that don't really <coughs> have any particularly beneficial effect on national security or on immigration. People having it more difficult to open bank accounts, having it more difficult to open drive to, to obtain driving licences. Um, which means that when you do get settled, then your life is much, much harder. Interestingly enough, the Home Office have had to accept that where they're making large payouts for unlawful detention damages cases, they do have to let the people open up bank accounts. <laughs> 
access to benefits has been a major issue. And for, since the 90s, then, most migrants who are not documented have, have not been able to access benefits. Um, now, uh, there are a number of routes where, by which um, people who've been in the country a long time or have British children or children who've been in the country a long time are able to regularise their stay. And I'm sure you, everybody would accept that this is a very desirable thing. People are going to be here, let's ensure that they are regularised. However, for some reason, for, to, to ensure that this doesn't become a pull factor in itself, then the very process for people regularising their, themselves is hit with huge charges for initial applications. So a person who is trying to, a single person with a British child who is applying on the basis that they do have the right to be here would have to pay £1,033 plus a £500 NHS surcharge for a two and a half year visa. If the child is not British, but has been here a very long time, then that application, with no 100% prospect of success, would be another £1,033 for a child. There is a, a possibility of obtaining a fee waiver, if you can show that you're destitute, um, which begs the question of how they think people in that position would not be destitute if they're going to be paying £3,000 for those applications. Leave is granted in, for, for two and a half years, at which point you have to do the same thing all over again. And in that period, that two and a half year period, the grant will be that you are not given <coughs> access to benefits. So that means that you're not able to access the normal sorts of benefits that people with children really need, and you're not able to access social housing at that point either. You can apply to have that um, application, that, that restriction lifted if you can find someone to help you do it, or if you know what you're doing. And then at the end of the two and a half years, when you apply again, you have to do the whole thing again. You have to show that you're destitute to get the fee waiver, and then you have to afterwards, you'll have to show that you're destitute again still to get to retain access to benefits, access to public funds afterwards. Overall, that means that people who are definitely going to be here, people who are parents of British children, have a right to be in this country, are being told, you really are not welcome, you really are not part of this country. And the effect of that on um, them, on the, uh, the pressure that it puts on them, the pressure it puts on their communities, and the pressure it puts on the agencies that are trying and struggling to assist them is um, that there is no excuse for it. The last thing I want to talk about before I go, before I finish, is the way that people who are part of the, very much part of the European Union were, were treated. European rough sleepers, rough sleepers who are um, uh, happen to be members of Euro European nationals. Last year, the two years ago, the Home Office introduced a policy whereby these people could be detained and removed simply for rough sleeping. Doesn't didn't matter if they were permanent residents here. Didn't matter if they were working. The challenge with that was successful only because of a combination of lawyers, community activists and the rough sleepers themselves were prepared to <coughs> stand on this and ultimately that policy was, was not back. I think my mind was up. Well, certainly, would have got one last line. I've got one thing that I do want to say. Despite the, 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 the pushbacks that have been successful, I think I've talked about, one thing I do want to say is that the, the, the spearhead for a lot of this is the, 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 the least popular minorities, the least popular groups of people. And a lot of the, the anti-migrant stuff has come on the back of attack of, of hysteria about foreign national prisoners. And we saw last week a story in The Guardian again, well done then, about an Afghan man who had been put in prison for a whole six weeks, I think it was, and deported with no right of appeal. He had an out-of-country right of appeal because he was a foreign national prisoner. And um, what happened to him in Kabul? He'd said, I can't go back to Kabul because I'm going to be killed. He was back in Kabul two weeks ago, he was shot. So I think when we talk about fight about complicity, then we need to be, be very clear that 
People have to be treated the same regardless of their migration status. That they cannot be um, one group of people that are going to be picked on, they're going to use the scapegoats because otherwise that is going to come back on the rest of the migrant community and the rest of us all. Thank you. Thanks very much. is Julius McCarthy, who's a, a, a barrister and the chair of Africans for Labour, and also has been a councillor. You're very welcome. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, I am going to try to keep it really short and use um, uh, examples to demonstrate what I have to, to say. Um, <coughs> The Windrush team, as we know, I'm not going to go into the history because I know we all know very well, but um, uh, to cut a very long story short, from 1947 when Commonwealth citizens were all united here to make this country great again, <laughs> or happy, or joyfully working together. The Act uh, of 1947 was passed with the associated pronouncement and saying, yeah, we can all stay now here, we are all brothers and sisters. And everything went well. Fast forwarding to 2012, when the right wing press started coming up with all these headlines, more refugees coming into our country, um, uh, more primary goes on in the areas of minority ethnic and all sorts of really, really vile things and saying things, things that really meant that 